when it comes to those sorts of biases, it can be intraracial as where as well as interracial as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I definitely have had to check myself in terms of some of my own beliefs or some of my own biases when it comes to other black people, right? Mm -hmm. And saying, what is it I'm, that I am learning about even just other people who look like me? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it takes me back when I was younger, I grew up in predominantly upper middle class, really white areas. And I remember the first time um, my dad took us to New York to visit cousins of mine. And we had some cousins that lived in Queens. And when we got there and it was predominantly black and brown and I was, me and my brother were visibly uncomfortable. And my dad had to have conversations with us, like, why are you uncomfortable around other people who look like you? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, because sort of thing. Mm -hmm. and, and so, so many times we think of those biases as terms of interracial, they could mm -hmm. be intraracial and even lead to um, those sorts of incidents or even discomfort or even dislike of your own people or even elements of who you are. I like to go to the local McDonald's here sometimes to get my Diet Coke. And I was sitting in the parking lot in my car listening to the radio as I do sometimes. And um, just something crazy happened, which paused, made me question myself and my motivations. But I, I was sitting there looking down at my phone and all of a sudden I hear somebody shouting right in front of my car. And I look up and it's a black man. And I immediately like locked my doors and, mm. and, you know, that's just a reaction that I had because he startled me. He was shouting. And then, you know, it, and then I, I start questioning myself, but then I remember, okay, so there's a few, a few other details to the story that when you add to them, I wonder, does it, does it, you know, I could tell he looked at me and he was like, okay, I know what just happened here. And I was like, oh gosh, okay. I had that immediate like reaction, like yeah, the white questioning gold. myself, but then there, there's more layers to the story too. Then I thought about it and I thought, well, he was wearing a camouflage jacket. Okay. So that maybe that had something to do with my startle, but also maybe that he's a black man. I don't, you know, it's hard to know your motivations, but also add another layer to it. He was shouting at somebody. So that was like, okay, that was a little startling. And then add to that, there was actually a few years ago, there was a mass shooting in that very parking lot. There was a hair salon that in, is in that complex and there were eight people shot. Um, that was about maybe five or six years ago. Um, and one of the people was shot in their car, sitting in their car, eating food from one of the places there. He was shot in the head. The guy came by and shot him in the head. So then I, I sat there thinking, you know, all this stuff swimming in my head. Um, all those layers of complexity to that interaction was, I, it was, it was a bit much for me and I just couldn't get it out of my head. And I don't want to. I don't want to absolve myself because of any of the extenuating circumstances. I do think I probably reacted because, in that instance, it was a black man, and that probably is the first thing that struck me. And I just, in all honesty, I just want to say I think I've thought a lot about what happened, and I really want to question myself and 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 whether. I started relying on those mitigating circumstances too much in my head or, you know, was that, or, or were they mitigating circumstances at all? You know, anyway, that was just something that happened that really made me look deep and question my reaction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I wanted to, I wanted to follow the man and say, I am, I am so sorry. But then I realized that was the wrong thing to do. I wanted to jump out of my car and go up and say, mm -hmm. I had a bad reaction. I'm so sorry. But then I thought that might just, be the wrong thing to do in that moment. I just didn't know what to do. And, you know, it just caused me to look inward. And mm -hmm. anyway, that that's what happened. My first thought, Susan, was more gender related than anything else. Oh, yeah, like, that's true. I would too. just say yeah. if a man, period, were in front of my car or anything that sort, that just as a woman, I would be on alert. As um, well, yeah. So that's one thing that I'm absolutely impressed. So I'm trying to sit here and be like, oh, with the race of the man, like really change things where I'm just like, I really don't know. I mean, there's so many things that go into my experience. Like I live alone. Yes. I live, like I live on the first floor of a condo building where it's like access, like right to the street. So I'm even worried about when people see me going to and from like Ubers or cars or whatever yes. and see me walking right into my unit. I'm aware if there is anybody around 
you know, that kind of a thing. So I think as women, we have that in common yeah. and, and, and thinking about yeah. those sorts of, of things. So may I say something? Because I take what you just said, Marin, but Susan didn't have a reaction around gender. She had the internal reaction and reflection around race. And Susan, I, what do you think triggered that? Gender could be part of it. Yes, absolutely. Because as women, we are, I mean, I think that's so automatic in my mind, it didn't even occur to me because I'm always, I, you know, when you're, when you encounter men in the world, I mean, just as women, we are, there's a guard that's always there. And so oh, maybe that's just innate. I mean, I'm just so used to that. It's second nature. That's, that's, that's how we, a lot of women just go, we are in the world in that mode. And maybe, you know, as, uh, as blacks, maybe you're, you know, maybe well, do you that's think the way you're in the world as well, you- but. Do you think you would have reacted differently had he been white, though? Would you have had that same guard or degree if he were a white man? Someone that looked like... Maybe maybe not. Maybe but not. It has, to be, it has to be that there are other things besides skin color that are mm-hmm. markings. And you you assess... You like one white man I would be afraid of, another white man I would not. It really depends on my instinct of what that person's ability to threaten me is. Like, Yeah, and I agree with you, is That's why I said of, someone that looked like Todd, because yeah. Todd didn't have a threatening demeanor. Right. Well, if he was wearing a camouflage jacket and was shouting and, you know, right in front of my car, maybe, yes, I might be hyper aware, but I, I don't know if the reaction, I don't know, I'm not sure. How, I'm just really not sure. I just question myself all on that. And I feel badly because that man walked away in a state where I knew he was it was not a good state for him to walk away in. And I just feel badly about it. And anyway, that's and it. That's all I wanted to hear. Marcus, my, you... like, depending on where it is, um, my reaction based on race would have been, I guess, opposite of what's expected. So in Chicago, I live here in Hyde Park, you know, on the South side. And so honestly, if it were something that were near my home, I would have reacted more alarmingly if he were white because this is a predominantly black area. And like, unless some people are going to and from the University of Chicago campus, like you just don't see a lot of white people around. Like, so it would have been like, what's he doing like in the neighborhood kind of a thing. Um, I can't can't say I would have had that same reaction if it were like my old neighborhood, which was like downtown Chicago, which is a little bit of a vice versa. So that's, yeah. So context matters is what you're saying, Mary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mark, I, Marcus, how do you how do you take it in? Um, Susan's reflection, reaction, reflection, um, as it relates to who you are and what you do. Uh, for me, it's more based on a totality. Like, what was he yelling at? Was he yelling at you? Was he yelling at someone else? What was he, he yelling about? Well, he was shouting. I shouldn't say he was yelling. He was more shouting at somebody across the parking lot. So I think he was just trying to get somebody's attention across the parking lot. It wasn't a, a, an, a, an aggressive thing, but just the shout and being so close just kind of startled me. And look, I looked up and I had this immediate visceral, re- visceral reaction, lock my doors. You know, that's all I can say. And um, so I think... For me, for me, it's not going to be... It's probably probably the unpopular opinion but to me it's better safe than sorry so Hmm. you got a reaction and thank god in that instance you were able to reflect on it and it ended the way it did but Mm -hmm. the same thing it could have very likely not it could have been something more devastating or traumatic i I so appreciate you guys being your generosity here and in in assuming best intentions and everything i think i really really and your honesty, I really appreciate it. Um, and I, I just feel bad that the gentleman walked away. He, he left with a bad experience. And I, you know, I, I just really wish I could have a conversation with him. It's a, I don't know. Just yeah, I perhaps, mean, I mean, and this is probably another way to kind of let yourself off the hook a bit. Like if your reaction would have been consistent, regardless of race, then okay. Like it would have, I, I think it would be different if it were like, oh, if this person were white, I would have reacted this way, but because he was black or whatever, I called the police, you know, like something that is oh yeah, like drastically different. But if just like, no matter what, you're like, hey, if a strange man is, you know, yelling at me or whatever, I don't know who he is, just period, I'm locking my car doors. I mean, that's just. It was it. a gut reaction. Yeah. yeah. 
And once my once my mind took over from the, my gut, I was like, oh, okay, he's fine. He's just talking. He's just talking to somebody. It's fine. Uh, you know, I had to do the little processing in my head for a. For have you a shared thought. this? Have you shared this experience with other white people? And if so, no, what nobody. You? I've not. I've not shared this with anybody. Mm. Landon, you were you were going to say something. What, what were you going to share? Uh, I like Marcus's uh, idea that it's, it's the totality of it. I, I think race is part of that totality, but uh, yeah. how, much, how much and to what degree, it's really hard to answer those kind of questions, right? But it might be a small degree, it might be a slightly larger degree. Um, to me, it, it would be, you know, how does the man look? Um, what is he wearing? Is there any kind of things that suggest he's conforms with the law, you know, willingly or does not, right? These kind of things people wear um, on, you know, how they dress. And sometimes it's a complete mischaracterization. But yeah. They wear those things that suggest certain attitudes of, around, right? So we kind of read that rapidly um, <laughs> and assess the situation immediately. And then, and then yeah. we can be like, you know, he's maybe that's a complete mischaracterization and often it's completely wrong. Right. But that's what our brain does automatically. So. And, and my brain does that. Yeah. I was going to say, here's a, fun, here's a funny thing. Um, another circumstance where I judge somebody based on wearing a hoodie, my husband and I were walking down our street here at night, you know, and we live near a pretty rough area. So we're kind of on guard, you know, aware. And this man was walking toward us, a really huge man with his head down and a hoodie, black hoodie pulled down. And we both were kind of tensing up. And then he gets closer to us and he looks up and he flips the hood back. And he's our he's our very gay, very white neighbor. And he says, hi. <laughs> I was like, oh, I got that one completely wrong. But I have a <laughs> question for you, soul, soul you can imagine. But the hoodie, the hoodie pulled down and him being big, I was just, you know, completely misjudged. I have a question for you, Susan. Did any stereotypes come up, or even if for a slight second, in your in your situation at McDonald's, and yeah. clearly some in encountering your friend just now, the story you just told, some stereotypes came up, and I was just wondering, in the McDonald's situation, did any stereotypes come up, and if so, what were they? Probably, yeah. Um, well, just the ja the the camouflage jacket that that was like uh, I mean even though that's a common way to dress I think that that might have that really jumped out at me and in in my initial I think assessment was was like oh that's you know you saw camo and did you think danger or yeah the one yeah I think I'm I think especially since a mass of, shooting had happened in and there was a mass lot. shooting in that park in that very same parking lot so yeah. that that was like you know all of that coming at me at once. So I think yeah. I did stereotype that stuff and I probably stereotyped a, a black man too. So, um, you yeah, know. I'll just say for a business that I, you know, another business that I, that I have, um, I recently got an email address that said can't the, the title of the, of the, of the email address was camo something. And I, I all automatically started thinking all sorts of things about the person yeah. Behind yeah. that email. So I didn't even see a camo jacket. I just saw someone who's going to label their email with camo Right. Uh, I, I have associations come to yeah, mind. That suggests a certain type of worldview, right, of the person. It may not be accurate, but it 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 really right. is something there, right? There's some substance to it, right? Yeah. For me, I think the question becomes: What's the difference between the instinct and the reflection, right? I mean, we're so you know we're socialized all sorts of ways, you know, based on all the things you all shared, right? Whether it's gender, nighttime, daytime, what they're wearing, you know, all sorts of you know, who they're yelling at, you know, all, all sorts of things. Um, you know, I think over time, as we get to know, you know, know people who we have these associations with, whether it's someone who wears a hoodie or someone who's black or white, you know, over time, those kinds of instincts can perhaps change and shift perhaps slowly. Mm -hmm. But the truth is we are the beings that we are in this moment based on everything we've taken in and changing that initial reaction, um, is, you know, not knowing, you know, as Susan shared, not knowing all the factors that might have gone into it is, I mean, I think it's good to be aware of it. I think the reflection that comes afterwards is, is for me, the more important thing, you know, did you, did you at least start to think about what might have gone into that? Did, you know, did it make an impression on you that you had that reaction and then you saw that it was okay and you saw the reaction in the other person and how might that start shifting those instinctive reactions? 
And, you know, what Andre always likes to ask is like, what do you, what do you then do with that awareness? Right. Um, uh, that, that might change the way we react in appropriate situations to change. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes those are not, you know, situations to even change, as Marcus said, sometimes. And I asked that question very deliberately about what do you do with that awareness? Because policy gets created based upon, you're like Todd said, the beings that we are, right? So when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about the differences between black people and white people, because I was at a house party last night and black people tend to be very gregarious, very open. So we will shout across the street and say, hey, man, come out, like someone that we recognize or whatever. When I've been in these so say white neighborhoods that I've realized that that behavior is not very common. If a right. white person wants to get the attention of someone across the street, they cross the street and then they will in their white, in their white way uh, get that person's attention, right? And so when sometimes in that reflection, I have to wonder whether there's any confirmation bias that reinforces the stereotypes that comes up and then policy gets made off of that confirmation bias. And then all of a sudden we are being redlined out of neighborhoods or being charged triple the interest rate when we try to get a mortgage, when we get approved, because you want your neighborhood to have a certain rules of engagement in it that are antithetical to how you've commonly seen Black people engage the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're saying these associations that might just have to do with certain cultural differences carry with them certain evaluations. I know they do. And mm -hmm. it may lead to influence the kinds of policies you will or will not support. Yes. Is that or decisions made, you know. Well, we were all standing in my brother's driveway last night because black folks have parties outside. We don't sit in the house. <laughs> but, but, and so, and I said, make sure you invite the neighbors. And they even came over so they don't call the cops on us. Cause you got 15 black people jamming the music, telling funny stories. But I say all of this to say is that Susan is a sophisticated enough person to reflect and understand all the dimensions and the aspects that could have been at play in the situation also in her own mind. But not every person, not every white person is a Susan. And sometimes those white people are of influence. They're in the they're in the position to influence public policy. And if we go and operate our lives on assumptions and stereotypes, that can have a negative consequence for the other party. You know, like I think, go ahead, mm -hmm. wait, Susan. Co conversations like this are are especially helpful to me to to you know mitigate those thoughts and mm -hmm. and going in unproductive directions. How so? How so, Susan? What what well, it's just is making me more aware of my internal bias. You know, it's just kind of it's it's you once you become more aware of something, it's easier to just, you know, deal with it in a more productive way, I think. Yeah. Well one of the things I that was... Susan, when you talked about the person wearing camo that I've come to realize as a late is my own bias is I get really nervous around homes or businesses that are waving American flags. Yep. Mm -hmm. Trump's I understand. Yes, yes. yes. I, I, I do the I same. Very much. I do and the I was, same. And I remember just reflecting and being like, that's really sad because it's not like I'm not proud to be an American. Like it's supposed to be like a symbol that, rec you know, represents, you know, being proud of whatever to be an American. But yeah, I mean, even um, last weekend I was driving um, to and from Minneapolis, and I just noticed, you know, in certain neighborhoods or, you know, in certain cities or towns that we were driving through that as soon as I saw, like, the American flags everywhere or whatever, I remember I was just like, drive on through. <laughs> this is not the place to stop for gas, uh, kind of a thing. And so that's been something that's a bit disappointing. Yeah, yeah. I, I would just share, share that, Maren, because I want it to know that it's not just a, a racial thing. I have, I have felt the same way. Um, and and have reflected in the same way. I mean, my, you know, I am where I am. And because my grandparents were taken in by the United States after a lot of effort after the Holocaust, you know, mm -hmm. um, they were rejected, they were rejected, they were, they were finally taken in. And thus, I have the life that I have. And I feel very patriotic in that way. And, and obviously love where I am. And at the same time, you're white. I have, I have some of the same associations that you just shared, you know, and I have to check myself um, in, in the way that you just shared. So I just wanted to affirm that kind of reaction. And because I don't want people to think it's just a racial reaction. Um, Landon, you had, you had something you wanted to share as well. 
Yeah, I mean, I uh, I understand what Andre is saying because um, I'm married to a woman from uh, Central America, and they have the same um, cultural values in a lot of ways. It's very open. Um, it's very much uh, you're out there and you have parties. You park on the lawn. <laughs> you yes. uh, you know you 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 can you can spend time together with neighbors and family for like. 24 hours in a row, it's just totally normal, you know? So um, I think that that's, there's a lot of cultural differences there. Um, I think Hispanics share that similar cultural trait. And it is sometimes kind of crazy for me to look across the divides, you know, between, you know, more restrained um, white Christian culture versus the Hispanic culture. Um, I, I really love uh, parts of the Hispanic culture, but sometimes it wears me out, you know, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but, uh, but honestly, um, that's, I'm, a, I live in Escondido, uh, California and it's, um, 60% Hispanic. And honestly, it's, I really like that culture. You know, I really think it's very healthy. Um, so, so I appreciate it, but I understand, uh, yeah, there, you know, and especially in different classes, you know, when you start getting into class, uh, race and class there, then, you know, Rich white neighborhoods, they they're super quiet. Mm -hmm. um, often people don't really know each other at all. You know, it's kind of, um, and it's nice to have a more open aspect to the culture where people are more friendly and community based. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other thoughts or reflections on on what Susan shared and what we're talking about before? Well, I appreciate what Maren said about the, the flag because we used to hang a flag out front for July 4th and Memorial Day um, and Veterans Day and we don't anymore. Yeah. And, I, I also just, just wanted to say um, what you said, it's that when it comes to those sorts of biases, it can be intraracial as, we're, as well as interracial as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I definitely have had to check myself in terms of some of my own beliefs or some of my own biases when it comes to other black people, right? Mm -hmm. And saying, what is it I'm, that I am learning about even just other people who look like me? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it takes me back when I was younger, I grew up in predominantly upper middle class, really white areas. And I remember the first time um, my dad took us to New York to visit cousins of mine. And we had some cousins that lived in Queens. And when we got there and it was predominantly black and brown and I was, me and my brother were visibly uncomfortable. And my dad had to have conversations with us, like, why are you uncomfortable around other people who look like you? Mm. Like, mm. you know, because sort of thing. Mm. And, and so, so many times we think of those biases as terms of interracial, they mm. could be intraracial and even lead to um, those sorts of incidents or even discomfort or even dislike of your own people or even elements of who you are. Um, so that was something I really intentionally pursued when I graduated and I went to college, like I think I've shared, my time at Stanford, I really entrenched myself in the Black community there. I've made sure I've done that in any different area where I've lived ever since, including my decision to live here um, in Hyde Park. And a lot of that has been not only, you know, the types of investments that I want to make in, in my community, but it's also, you know, that was just my way of really um, dealing with it and kind of confronting some of the biases that I had developed in growing up in really white environments. That's really interesting. Marin, can you, what do you think was making you, what were the, what were the signals you were getting that were making you uncomfortable back then? Um, it's just when you stop and think of, like, you know, at that point in time, I mean, I grew up in, in the eighties and when you stop in like predominantly black and brown neighborhoods were associated with being unsafe. Yeah. Um, and also I want to speak to a larger point, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Marin. Because you and I, because, <laughs> oh, we're best friends. We're yet so different. <laughs> because, because, because remember I told you, I said, you should have, you needed to, you needed hood ass cousins. That's why you behave that way. Because, well, so black people, and we are not like you white people. We're not like you where when you become wealthy and this, that, and the third, and you stop talking to the poor relations of your family, we don't do that. As black people, we all come together. And what that means is there is no class separation really in black families because you never know when you're going to need one another. And so well-to-do black people always have poor relations that live in rough and tumble neighborhoods. 
And generally, your mama, your daddy going to take you to go visit your cousins in, well, I don't want to say the hood, but that's what I'm going to call it. That's my vernacular, not everybody else's, but in the hood. And that's where you would have been socialized and say, okay, so when I'm around my sort of white contemporaries in our little neighborhood, eating our little Wonder Bread sandwiches and shit, I behave this one way. And then I behave another way when I'm with around my own people. And I think your father very aptly and adeptly and cleverly had to help you understand like you are, you know, we are, we are in a certain place, pardon me, to provide you and your brother with opportunity, but that does not mean you're not a part of this other group here that has a very different and its own rules of engagement. And you, as an intelligent young lady, need to be comfortable in both. Yeah. Well, yes. but there's a white yeah. version of that. Too. A double consciousness sort of a thing that I think W.E.B. Du Bois talked about, right? Um, where, you know, as Black people, oftentimes we do have to carry that double consciousness in terms of, Reality. you know, the way we carry ourselves and the way that we are, which, you know, gets into respectability politics and, and you know, and that whole thing, because, you know, sometimes where it can lead to conflict is when, you know, you're in predominantly white environments and you want to prove so well that you're not that kind of Black person, right? Mm -hmm. So you are overly friendly and overly articulate and overly like, I want to prove I'm a good Black person. Right. Um, but how that can come across as disassociating or being condescending to, you know, others. But yes, you also have to be ready and willing and able to navigate your own communities as well. It's definitely, um, I, I would say, a, a dance, a tap dance of sorts. Landon, you were going to say something. You said there's a white version of this, too. Yeah, there's white versions of this, and it's across yep. uh, cities and rural. Um, mm. it's, a, it's across religious and non-religious. You know, mm. I'm doing that tap dance all the time with my family um, and cousins that I have, you know, like they immediately have a dislike for me, probably uh, because I'm from a big city in California and I go into small towns, um, farm towns, and, you know, they already like have a little bit of bias against you. So you're trying to overcome that perceived bias. Like you're trying to be a little bit too friendly and, you know, play up your small town roots a little bit and all this stuff. And, you know, I did not know that. Yeah. And the same thing with um, religious and non-religious, you know, um, I have most of my family's religious. I'm, I'm not, but you know, mm -hmm. it's like, um, it's hard to fit in. Those are, those are really strong fault lines. You know, you have to try to dance across them and, and it still makes it hard, you know? Um, but sometimes you can, if they have an open mind as well, then you can really meet in the middle, you know, but it's not always possible. So. Yeah. I have exactly, Landon, you... exactly that same experience with rural family, small town family, and I'm a city, our, my family is city, and right. then we have the religious, most of the family's religious, I'm not, so I, I can completely uh, understand. Landon, did you grow up with that? Because you said you you grew up in kind of a more urban area, but you went a lot to to... Yeah rural areas and so were you navigating that as you grew up um these, these yeah, well when i grew up we didn't have to worry about these things i i would go to the farm my grand, grandparents farm and and just play with my cousins you know we just had a great time but then as they got older you know you could see this like uh, a <laughs> little bit of a questioning looks <laughs> as you came down there right? when did you become uh, aware of that when was that like 15 17 16 when did uh, you no, that was started? probably in my 20s you know like 20s. they just weren't friendly anymore uh, and we had so many good times uh mm. and i used to go down there and spend a lot of time um you know but they didn't have the, any of those biases um but they all came up <laughs> it's kind of like resentments in, in some ways cultural and societal resentments get played onto you right so yeah. I think um, we're always we're always comparing ourselves to others, and with family, it's even more in, you know can be more intense. Yes, it is intense in families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Marcus, how do you how do you take all this in? Um, you know, you shared your own experience. I think in the second conversation, when you were reflecting on the first conversation, you shared, you know, that you felt maybe there was a little sheltering of your experience, um, and I'm wondering, and and you you said that you were, were that, that your parents let you know you had to, you weren't going to get as much grace, right? Um, but at the same time, they said, now go, don't, you know, don't go out and embarrass us, right? And mm -hmm. it reminded me when, when Marin was talking about, you know, respectability politics and trying to, to, to be a certain way, right? Um, 
it reminded me a little bit of that conversation that you had. Uh, you know, I I don't know if that hits you at all, but for me, it made me yeah. think of. And how do you how do you ref, you know respond to that? It does. It's funny because I'm sitting here and I'm listening to everyone talk, and for me, we're all saying the same thing in a different way. And I think there's so many different variables. There's race. There's wealth. There's oh. I left the country and I moved to the city. Uh, I want to be black, but not too black, but I still want to be down to earth. Um, I was poor. Now I have affluence and money, but I'm still relatable. I want to be able to intermingle with those people, but I want to fit into this society as well. And there's so many different variables. And we're literally Susan, Andre, Marin, Landon, we're all saying the same thing in a different way and that's just life it's life we want to be able to fit into all societies and everyone is judging everyone but we all want to fit in thank you for watching this episode of healing race and stay with us for a scene from our next video if you want to see more conversations like the one you just watched Please subscribe to our channel, share this video with friends and family, and like and comment on the video below. If you'd like to be a guest on one of our episodes and have an open, real conversation about race, email us at guests at healingraceshow.com. And if there are topics you think we should cover, we'd love to hear them. So please email your ideas to topics at healingraceshow.com. As always, thanks for your support. We look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Now, here's a scene from our next healing race. Is your success determined more on your own hard work and drive, or, you know, is it more the other way? You're more a victim of your circumstance, and no matter how how, how hard you try, that you're just, you know, there's forces external to you that keep you down and that you have no control over. And what's you know, what's the balance there? How much are we really a meritocracy or not? To watch the rest of that episode, go ahead and click the video below me. To see a different compelling Healing Race episode, you can click the video below me. We look forward to seeing you in the next video.